Good morning, church. Good morning. good morning, church. It is good to see you here today. It's time change. We got winter still. We've got some rain, and but the temperatures were warming up, so I'm dressed enthusiastically for spring. All right, I'm trying to usher, do my part to usher it in. All right. Have you ever wondered why some people are able to do what they do and why others don't? What is it about a person that they would risk everything? Life, limb, liberty to help others when most people wouldn't. What is it that's even more amazing is that when you see this kind of person and you would speak to them afterwards, they would say, look, I wasn't doing anything amazing. I was just doing what anybody would do in the same situation. But that's not true. Two stories, briefly. Michael A. Mansour. He was assigned as a SEAL working in Iraqi province. When his team had been fighting in the morning and then again in the afternoon insurgents. He was stationed on the rooftop with his team. And he was instructed by his commander to take a position flanking right between two other snipers. When suddenly an insurgent tossed a grenade up onto the rooftop. He saw it, he yelled grenade, and it, it, before he could even speak it again, he knew that his comrades would be killed instantly. He threw himself on the grenade as it exploded. It absorbed the impact, saving the life of his teammates. But that 25-year-old paid with his life that night. Never gave it a second thought. Now to the other extreme. A four-year-old in Birmingham, Alabama, wants to use his allowance money to help to feed the homeless. He dons a cape and he goes out with his dad and he puts sandwich meals together and he introduces himself as President Austin. <laughs> He's got a plan to fix things. President Austin goes out and hands out sandwiches to the homeless. But more than that, respect, love care, concern. What is it? What is it about people who would give of themselves so unselfishly, so sacrificially, and others don't? Well, I think I've narrowed it down. It comes down to this. Some people choose to see themselves as victims in life. And their whole world revolves around them. Others see themselves as victors in life. And it's all about others. One focuses on what it's all can be about me. Others for the other. And you see, for us, the changes that take place in us as believers goes from being all about us to being others-focused. But we can't get there on our own. I've wondered why it seems that certain people and not others are able to move beyond this victim kind of mindset. Move from this way of thinking to this way of thinking? I think the real answer is, is simply a matter of decision. Yeah. As simple as it sounds, it's a decision. Sometimes made at that crucial moment when everything hangs in the balance, like Michael A. Mansour. It can become the defining moment of a person's life. like little President Austin. One decision makes the difference between being a victim or being the victor. One decision 
can determine your purpose in life. One decision can define what you were meant to do, who you were meant to be in life. One decision may be why you were born for such a time as this. We all want to know the big questions in life. Who am I? What's my purpose in life? Why am I here? What am I supposed to do? Why do I exist? Those are natural questions we all ask ourselves throughout the course of our life. And at this point in my life, at 57 years old, I've come to understand that the answers to those lie in these really profound kind of things. Some of the answers we find as we live life. Some of the answers we find as we come to love God. Some of the answers we find as we listen to God's word. His Holy Spirit and godly people around us. Some of the answers we find as we accept and learn to see things from God's perspective. Such was the case when we reviewed the Old Testament story that we're going to be looking at today. It's the story of Esther. Now, I've got just a few moments to share with you this incredible book. And it's in a really, it's an amazing book. But you're looking at ten chapters in this book. And it's probably one of the most amazing books in all of Scripture. Because the book of Esther is the only book in all of God's Word that never references once God. there's a reason. The writer very, very keenly draws us into an understanding that God is intricately a part of this entire story. Get behind the scenes. We can learn a lot from that. Because we have a tendency to, to want to see things in our perspective. And we wonder from our perspective, where is God at work? Is he here? Is he there? Is he in this person or that person? I don't see him. I don't feel him. I don't know that he's in the midst of all of this. And so we worry, we fuss, and we fight. And we find ourselves victimized by our thoughts and by the outside situation, circumstances we find ourselves in. In fact, when we shift our perspective... We start to see things from God's perspective and suddenly we see him everywhere in everything and in everyone that's going all around us. Because you see, God is sovereignly in control of everything. And as we talked about last week, everything means what? Everything. There you go. You're catching on. You're smarter than you look. <laughs> see? Allow me to set the story up. Here's the backdrop. John MacArthur helps out. The king in the book of Esther is none other than Xerxes. He's the son of Darius who fought the Greeks and ultimately lost the Persian Empire to the power of the Greeks. This is the man who tried to conquer Greece with a quarter of a million soldiers. This is the man, Ahasuerus, the king in the book of Esther, who is the one who becomes the ruler of that empire after the death of his father. He's the man who has in his heart conquered by this Jewish orphan girl named Esther. And when the opportunity came, she would use her influence to save the Jewish race from genocide. That's the story of Esther. How one woman, through the providence of God, saved the Jews from genocide. Now, we could stop right there and go, wow. There you go. Charlie just summed it up. But we have some things we need to learn from this. The book has her name, but not because she wrote it. She didn't write it. We don't know exactly who did. Maybe it was Ezra. Maybe Nehemiah. Maybe, maybe one of the characters in the book, Mordecai. Whoever the author is, the real author of the story is God. Behind this incredible story, we see in divine providence played out completely. The book opens by describing this incredibly beautiful and expansive kingdom. It stretches from Ethiopia to the edges of India and all the way up to what would be called modern day Libya or Pakistan. 
He's not only the son of Darius, he's the grandson of Cyrus the Great. Cyrus the Great, the Persian ruler who decreed that Jews could go back to their land after 70 years of captivity. That's how the book of Esther begins. Many Jews went back to Israel under the decrees of Cyrus, the grandfather of Xerxes. They went back, they rebuilt the city of Jerusalem, they rebuilt the temple, the second temple. They reestablished themselves in the land. There was a large number of Jewish people who had been exiled to Babylon who decided to remain there. They settled, they didn't scatter, they proliferated. And they did very, very well in that area. But several years into the reign of Ahasuerus, excuse me, Xerxes, the book of Esther opens when the king calls this six-month summit. Now, this isn't just a regular summit. This is a party of all parties, but it's designed with the intent that he's going to bring all of his captains, all of his religious, his religious folks, his leaders, his uh, knowledgeable folks. He's going to bring them all in and all of his military people, all of his captains and generals and all this kind of stuff, and they're going to have a, a big six-month summit. Because his whole plan is, is to gear up to show them how we're going to go and we're going to defeat Greece. So this is sort of like the planning summit and party for all of that. And at the end of this summit, he's going to wrap it up with the party of all parties. And at the end of this party, he decides he's going to have the queen brought over. Now this has been a pretty wild party, drunken party with all kinds of crazy revelry going on. You might think of it as um, a little out of the, the norm, over the top, a little outrageous. Yeah, it was that kind of party. The queen, Queen Vashti is her name. And on the last seventh and last day of this final party, the king commands that she come and she says, no, I'm not coming. I'm not interested in being entertainment for your drunken friends. Well, that kind of doesn't go real well with the king. He's embarrassed in front of all his friends. This is public insubordination. Public embarrassment. And if the king's wife can get away with this. Well, that's got a, gonna be a problem for everybody. So the king puts his royal foot down and he decides he's gonna demote her. And after talking with some of his advisors, he decides that something has to be done because this can't start this rebellion of disobedience and insubordinate and disrespect. So not only does he de demote her, he deposes her. She's not queen of anything anymore. So now we have a problem. According to es Esther chapter 2, he's got to find a new queen. And he makes it very clear that no one's going to disobey the king, the king, not even the queen. So finding a new queen is paramount. Four years pass by. He gets around to selecting a new queen. Four years? Well, the reason for that is, is he was unsuccessful in his invasion of Greece. The very thing we began talking about in this incredible summit it's not gone as well as he'd liked. Greece happens in that two years. And then two more years. He's right in the middle of it. And he starts to think about it. And he's actually kind of back home now thinking about what's going to happen. And he decides to use this search for a new queen as a distraction. So he puts out this decree. From the border at the top to the southernmost border of the country, to the east and to the west, the proclamation is put out. Round up all the prettiest girls you can find and bring them into the kingdom. Get them cleaned up. They go through a process. And then 
they have just that one moment, that one brief moment to impress the king. And the one who does will become the new queen. Now, thousands and thousands of young women are brought into the kingdom. And they're brought into the palace. And they're prepared. And they go through a, a very long and arduous process of being prepared. They have all the most beautiful refining treatments and what have you. And finally, finally, one girl whose parents had been deceased, her uncle, Mordecai, says, Esther, this is your moment. There she goes. It's her opportunity. Esther goes before the king and wows her. Wows with her presence, her demeanor, her stature, her beauty, her poise. He's blown away. She becomes the one. Now, what she doesn't reveal is that she's a Jew. Out of 25 million women to pick from, he picks this incredibly beautiful orphan Jewish girl. They live in this area. Mordecai is her uncle. And out of all of these girls, she and Mordecai are the ones who go to the, to the palace. Now, the Bible text tells us that what happened then, okay, is that once she was taken to the palace and becomes the queen, this young woman, who's probably in her 20s, appears before the king, becomes the queen, and like a Cinderella story, she just steals this king's heart. Now, here's the thing. What is the likelihood that a little orphan girl from the middle of nowhere going to get caught up in 25 million woman campaign to search for the most beautiful woman in the kingdom is going to be selected and taken to the very top of those ranks and then chosen to be the queen of a pagan kingdom? Sound like something out of a storybook? does, doesn't it? God is at work in the midst of all of this. Not long after Esther is crowned, the story gets amazing. This is where we now find ourselves in Scripture. Dave, if you can put us up there, we're going to be going to Esther chapter 3. I want you to stand with me as we read God's Word together. After these events, King Xerxes honored Haman, son of Hamathra, the Agite, elevating him and giving him a seat of honor higher than that of all the other nobles. All the royal officials at the king's gate knelt down and paid honor to Haman, for the king had commanded this concerning him, but Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honor. Then the royal officials at the king's gate asked Mordecai, Why do you disobey the king's command? Day after day they spoke to him, but he refused to comply. Therefore they told Haman about it to see whether Mordecai's behavior would be tolerated, for he had told them he was a Jew. When Haman saw that Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honor, he was enraged. Yet having learned who Mordecai's people were, he scorned the idea of killing only Mordecai. Instead, Haman looked for a way to destroy all Mordecai's people, the Jews, throughout the whole kingdom of Xerxes. In the twelfth year of King Xerxes, in the first month, the month of Nisan, the Pur, that is, the lot, was cast in the presence of Haman to select a day in a month and the lot fell on the twelfth month and the month of Adar. 
Then Haman said to King Xerxes, There is a certain people dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom who keep themselves separate. Their customs are different from those of all other people and they do not obey the king's laws. It is not in the king's best interest to tolerate them. It pleases the king. Let a decree be issued to destroy them and I will give 10,000 talents of silver to the king's administrators for the royal treasury. So the king took his signet ring from his finger and gave it to Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Agite, the enemy of the Jews. Keep the money, the king said to Haman, and do with the people as you please. Then on the 13th day of the first month, the royal secretaries were summoned. They wrote out in the script of each province and in the language of each people all Haman's orders to the king's satraps, the governors of the various provinces, and the nobles of the various peoples. These were written in the name of King Xerxes himself and sealed with his own ring. Dispatches were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces with the order to destroy, kill, annihilate all the Jews, young and old, women and children, on a single day, the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. A copy of the text of the edict was, be, was to be issued as law in every province and made known to the people of every nationality so they would be ready for that day. The couriers went out and spurred on by the king's command and the edict was issued in the citadel of Susa. The king and Haman sat down to drink. But I can't see the rest of the text there. Go ahead. When Mordecai learned of all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on his sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the city, wailing loudly and bitterly. But he went only as far as the king's gate because no one clothed in sackcloth was allowed to enter it. In every province to which the edict and order of the king came, there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting, weeping, and wailing. Many lay in sackcloth and ashes. When Esther's eunuchs and female attendants came and told her about Mordecai, she was in great distress. She sent clothes for him to put on instead of his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther summoned Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs assigned to attend her, and ordered him to find out what was troubling Mordecai and why. So Hathak went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate. Mordecai told him everything that had happened to him, including the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the text of the edict for the annihilation which had been published in Susa to show Esther and explain it to her. And he told him to instruct her to go into the king's presence to beg for mercy and plead with him for her people. Hathak went back and reported to Esther what Mordecai had said. Then she instructed him to say to Mordecai, All the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that they be put to death unless the king extends the gold scepter to them and spares their lives. But 30 days have passed since I was called to go to the king. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will, be, will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows, but you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go gather all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. And I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. Let's pray. God, we come before you. And we recognize, Lord, that so often we see things from our own perspective and not from yours. I pray today 
that you would open our blinded eyes that we might see, our deaf ears that we might hear, our dull minds that we might grasp, and our hardened hearts that they might finally be receptive to your truths. For we ask this in the precious name of Jesus and all God's people said. Amen. You may be seated. Number one, you are where you are for your growth. Esther was at first thinking only of herself. Hathak went back and reported to Esther what Mordecai had said, and she instructed him to reply, if I walk in there, if anybody walks in there, unannounced, uninvited, unwelcome, there is but one law, that that person is going to be put to death unless the king extends the gold scepter to them and spares their lives. And it's been 30 days since he even called me up. Esther didn't start off as the heroine of this story. In fact, she was a victim, orphaned, living in exile far away from her homeland. And the only known living relative was Mordecai, her uncle. She was fearful, uncertain, and lacking confidence in herself and certainly in God. It was time to grow. Chapter 4, verse 11. All the king's servants and all the people of the king's provinces know that any man or woman who goes into the inner court to the king who has not been called has but one law. Put all to death. King hadn't seen her in 30 days. We have to be honest. He had a lot of other women. He had a lot of other concubines. He had a lot of other business. She was afraid of potentially violating her irrational husband's whims. I mean, after all, the only reason she was queen is because he demoted the prior queen. Mordecai was putting Esther in a position not only uncomfortable, not only compromising, but it could cost her her life. Mordecai, however, he comes back with a message of courage. Don't think in your heart that you will escape the king's palace any more than anybody else who's a Jew. And then he said this incredible phrase. Who knows, but that you've been put in this position for such a time as this. Wow. She could only do one thing now. Continue to be the victim or choose to be the victor. Either step up to the plate and do what you're in a position to do. Give it your all and trust God. Or shrink back from it. And never know. We read this incredible story and we think to ourselves, wow, that's an incredible tale. That's just fantastic how one brave woman did all of this. And yet, we miss the obvious lesson. It isn't just for Esther. It isn't just about the Jews. It isn't for just a time as that. It's for every one of us. See, Esther was in the right place at the right time and she did the right thing and she became this incredible icon of greatness. Courage. But all of us have that greatness and that potential there. Every one of us. Oh, I know you might think to yourself, not me. You don't know me. I'm the, the least of everybody. I, I didn't have that. I'm not going to. I'm not the biggest, the smartest, the brightest, the cutest. I'm not. I, I just. You're in victim mode. That's what victims say. That's what Esther started off with. You just don't know what's happened to me. You, I, I just, I, 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 really? She lost her parents. 
She lost her country. She lost her identity. She's living as a victim. What's your excuse? And yet God put her in a position where she had to say, I either will step up or I'll shrink back. Every one of us has the potential for greatness. And that move beyond victim to victor is that opportunity. Michael A. Mansour threw himself on a grenade to save him, his, his brothers in, in arms. Little President Austin, a four-year-old who wears a cape, spends his allowance to feed the homeless. Why? Because neither one of them were in victim mode. They were in victor mode. They were going to rise above the circumstances and they were going to help everybody along the way. What about you? It's amazing to me as a pastor. I sit in this incredibly advantageous position. I get to see a lot of things. I get to hear a lot of things. I get to experience a lot of things. I get to meet a lot of people. And what's funny to me is, is I get people coming alongside of me and say, you know, pastor, I saw this thing that's happening down here or at the church or over here at this family or, or over in this part of the community or at this school or at this business and somebody really ought to do something. Is that right? Hey, if God gave you the eyes to see it, maybe you're the one he wants to use to take care of it. Amen? amen. Are you with me? Say amen. Mm -hmm. but I like the way people do that mm -hmm. somebody needs to do something about that pastor I'll add that to the other 300 things on my plate today hey that might be your opportunity to don a cape might be your opportunity to step up instead of shrink back might be your opportunity to show others God at work behind the scenes. No, I'm not talking about where you're sharing scripture verses left and right, carrying your 50 pound skull field. No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about being Jesus in skin, right where you are. Giving up a parking space. So somebody who can't navigate the parking lot, walk that distance, can be a little closer. My wife taught me that. Going across the, the yard to the neighbor who's really struggling in the weather to get their garbage can down to the curb. So you take it. Or maybe in the summer when somebody's away on vacation, you mow their yard. Or maybe when you're out or maybe when you're out at, at lunch with a coworker, you look around and you see that lonely somebody who's sitting there by themselves and you pick up their tap. See, anybody can, anybody can shrink back. Anybody can see the problem. But it takes a whole different kind of person to see the possibilities and put the cape on. Amen? Yes, Esther chose to move from victim mode to victor mode. You are where you are for your growth. So she started and needed to believe that God was at work behind all this. That God was going to make it all happen. That when Mordecai put her slap on it and said, No, who knows that you're in a position such as this for such a time as this. It wasn't likely that a little Jewish girl was going to come up from obscurity out of 25 million women and end up coming to that position at that time and at that place for no reason at all. No, God had done that. God had done that. And I got to wonder. I got to wonder if every day in life as a Christian, as a believer, we aren't 
given opportunities for growth. Not just reading our Bible, not just praying, but to really stretch our faith wings. You know what I mean? To put it out there. And maybe, yeah, your body says, I can't. Maybe your spirit says, you won't. Maybe your guilt says, you never will. But faith, faith stretches all of that and says, you can, you could, you will with me. Faith stretches you outside the box of your own creation and moves you into that realm. God's plan for our growth means to blow away that selfish, centric mindset and start looking at where he's at work around us. God's plan for us in this growth means we become more like him and less like ourselves. The struggle comes when fear and doubt and that selfishness begins to encroach in us and we begin to shrink back and say, but I just don't know, it, it, it may cost me more. Yes, I'm just going to burst your bubble right now. Faith will cost you. It'll cost you to move beyond your comfort zones. More than your complacency. More than your comfort. If it doesn't, it isn't real faith. Amen? Because you're not growing. And someone a lot more eloquent than me said, unless you do that which is more than you've already accomplished, you will not grow. Your faith has to grow. Because God desires to help you grow, he's going to give you the tools to help you grow. You see, when you start trusting and believing in God, he'll start coming up alongside you to show you he's at work with you. Amen? Esther was now beginning to think about others. Bless you. But if you don't grow, you may never have come to a place where you'll learn what you could have been, what you could have done, how you could have seen God at work in your life. Likely you will always remain in victim mode. It's all about me. Esther's reply shows that she'd moved beyond victim mode and was moving into victor mode. Number two, you are where you are for others' good. Esther was now accepting her role in thinking and acting on behalf of others. The story progresses rather quickly. Haman had devised his wicked scheme and deceived the king and it, it was approved. Esther accepts her role in the grand design of God's will for her and her people. She fasts and prayerfully determines a plan of her own thinking and acting on that behalf for her people. Notice the steps that she took. She accepts her role. Two, she asked for others to fast and pray for her. Three, she acknowledges she too will fast and pray for three days. And four, she acts boldly. Oh, you know the Christianese. We like to use this phrase when somebody asks us to do something. I'll pray about that. I get that a lot as a pastor. I'll, I'll, I'll pray about that, pastor. I have. I've already prayed about it. That's why I'm here talking to you. <laughs> It's the right direction. But you know what's funny because that Christianese, that's a, that's a really polite way of saying, uh-uh, not me. We don't like that, do we? But Esther puts it right in there and she says, look, I'm not only going to pray about it, but I'm going to act on it and act boldly. Look, we need to shake off the victim mode. And when we start moving into victim mode, out of victim mode into victor mode, we need to shake off those old ways of thinking, that old ways of acting. Amen? Amen. We need to start moving prayerfully forward and saying, okay, God, you've given us the vision, you've given us the faith, and now you're giving us the prayerful uh, a direction. We're moving forward in that, and we're going to keep stepping out there. Even if, even if it costs us everything. Isn't it amazing that when we see people in life that, that just seem to do more and accomplish more and, and, and do more for God, 
They're the ones who are living out there in faith, walking out there by faith, and taking great steps boldly in faith. And we're all like, that's just amazing. It's not because of who they are. It's because of who they serve. They've moved from victim mode to victor mode. They have taken up, this is what he wants me to do. This is how I'm supposed to live. And this is how I'm supposed to walk. And this is how I'm supposed to talk. And whether it costs me everything, I'm doing it. Amen. Oh, but the truth is, we, you know how we live? Don't, don't set the bridge on fire. Don't do nothing crazy. We may have to back up a little bit here. Let's not just, just take it easy now. You know, just take it slow. We'll, we'll walk out there in faith, kind of like, I'm, I'm on my way. I'm, I'm on my way. I, I, I'll get there. And we wonder why everybody else is moving forward, why things are happening, and, and great things for God are being accomplished. And we're still, I'm, I'm coming. I used to hear people say, well, Pastor, I'm trying. Stop trying, do. <laughs> Amen? Amen. Look here. You are where you are for your growth. You are where you are for others' good. She kept moving forward. She kept making it happen. No longer a victim. Esther is now a victor. No longer paralyzed by fear and doubt and selfishness. Esther is moving forward in faith and trust. Does she have an idea of the whole plan? No. She couldn't possibly conceive of how God was going to make all this happen. But she knew her part was to act in faith. Amen? Amen. And that's what we need to do. Take a grasp, a grasp of what my part of this is. It's not to know the whole thing. It's not to do the whole thing. It's to do my part. And my part is to trust and obey and to act in the faith that I have. Amen? Amen. And that doesn't mean doing it. I'm on my way. I'm coming. Somebody needs to do the other part. The, the praying and the fasting. And somebody needs to move the doing. And she did it. So somebody brings the royal records and the king begins to read them and God begins to move and God begins to do and he's working in this person and this person and they're praying people and moving it forward and now we see that the king's heart is beginning to turn favorably favorably to the truth. Now we go back to Esther. She approaches the throne can you imagine the moment she laid hands on the door and she's about to push open the door to that inner chamber and she's thinking, this is it. There's no going back. I got to do this and, and it's over. There's no more comfort. There's no more complacency. There's no more got letting go. This is it. Do you know we have folks today who are standing in the threshold of faith and they're saying, I want to be all that God wants me to be. I, I, I want to be that person. I want to live by faith. I want to I wanna have God be firmly in control of my life. I want the Holy Spirit in me, working through me and in me and to me and through me. And I want to live a life that's boldly for faith. But, but I'm going to stay right here until God just magically opens these doors. Whose responsibility is it? Boom! Boom! Push those doors open. Take those steps boldly. She comes. She looks at the king. And in that moment, their eyes meet. You can imagine the look on those people. They're all thinking, uh-oh, uh -oh. this ain't going to go well. And the king looks at her. She looks back at him. And he extends the royal scepter. You see, God had gone before. Long before she ever put her hands on the other side of that door, God had already begun to work in the king's heart and Xerxes has already begun to move, shift ever so favorably towards a different kind of thinking, a different way of thinking and looking back at who had done what and when and where and he began to see things from God's perspective. Haman's truth was being promoted out there and so that he was thinking about these things in his heart so when she came through that door and her eyes met his eyes and that scepter was pointed at her, she knew and he knew she was there for truth. She just wasn't blowing him away with beauty. 
He knew she had courage, character. She doesn't want anything of the kingdom. She wants to speak the truth. So she shares what she shares. And Esther's reply was a simple request. If I have found favor with you, your majesty, and if it pleases you, grant me my life. This is my petition. Spare my people. This is my request. For I and my people have been sold to be destroyed, killed, and annihilated. If we had merely been sold as male and female slaves, I would have kept silent. Because no such distress would justify disturbing the king. And King Xerxes asked Queen Esther, Who is he? Where is he, the man who has dared do such a thing? And Esther said, An adversary and enemy, the vile Haman. She pleads with the king. She's now out there 100%. It isn't the Jews. It is my people. She's taking 100% commitment in this. She's all in. Hey, when you're at work or at school, when you're out in the neighborhood and somebody, somebody needs to know about Jesus, are you willing to step up out and say, hey, I'm a believer? I live for Jesus. I believe in God's word. I go to church. I serve. I give. I'm all about allowing God to be my God and king. Even if it costs me. You see, that's, that's what the world wants to see. Oh, we're told. That's not what the world wants to see. But the reason we're told that is because so few people really live a life that's so dynamic for Christ that it changes the culture around them. As Bridget mentioned earlier, one out of 70,000 people can change the environment. Amen? Does anybody at work or school or in your neighborhood or in, in, in anywhere around you in your family, extended family or friends, people you do business with or, or recreate with, do they know that you're a believer who's willing to put everything on the line? To be a believer for such a time as this, even if it costs you everything? Third, you are where you are for God's glory. This was the proof meets the pudding time. This is it. It's important for us to know and remember that whatever God brings us to, God will bring us through. Everything in life is intended to help us grow in greater Christ-likeness, all for the good of others, and always and ultimately for God's glory. Mordecai and Esther chapter 9 recorded these events and he sent the letters to all the Jews throughout the provinces of King Xerxes near and far to have them celebrate annually the 14th and 15th day of the month of Adar as the time when the Jews got relief from their enemies and the month when their sorrow was turned into joy and their mourning into a day of celebration. He wrote to them, observe the days as a day of feasting and joy and giving presents of food to one another and gifts to the poor. So the Jews agreed to continue that celebration even up to this day. Here we come to the end of the book of, of Esther and we now see how God has intended for Esther to grow in her faith and trust in him to place herself completely in his will so that God could grow her in her faith, grow her in her trust and even when it didn't make sense that God would use her in a way that was far greater than she could have ever imagined. You are where you are for your growth. It may be painful It may be unpleasant and uncomfortable. But God is doing a work there. Don't try to get out of it. Don't try to get away from it. Don't try to use that as the excuse for why things are happening in your life. Instead, look to see where God's at work in it and thank him for it because you see and believe him in it. Amen? 
we see how God intended for us to not only grow in our faith and trust in him, but God has used her for others' good. Let me tell you the in-betweens of this. Haman's plan was discovered as a hateful, vile act of vengeance. He didn't like Mordecai as a person. So he decided to take his anger out against Mordecai, against an entire people group. Thousands were going to die. So Haman devised this incredible plan. He was going to have them all destroyed in every province. And right there where he was, he was going to make sure that the biggest gallows he could find and build was going to be built right there at the palace so he could have hung on those gallows Mordecai. And he would celebrate that right then, right there. What he didn't realize was, is that as God was working in the king's heart and God was revealing the truth of all this, Haman was the one who was actually hung on the very gallows he had ordered built. God miraculously saved his people while destroying Haman and their enemies. Now you might be thinking, well this is a wonderful, fantastic historical tale, Pastor. I appreciate you sharing that with us. But what's that got to do with us? Because I, I really don't know if there's any Hamans out there today for us. You were wrong. You have a Haman. I have a Haman. They're the enemies of the flesh, the world, and Satan. And they're all the time looking to do everything they can do to bring us down and defeat us. To destroy us. God says, I've already defeated them. You're free. You are where you are for others' good. You need to start telling others the good news of Jesus Christ that they've been set free. See how God intended for us to not only grow in our faith and trust in Him, but to do good for others as well. To bring about God's glory. Every year at that same time, Purim, the Jews celebrate this incredible victory by God over their enemies. You are where you are for God's glory. There's a good bet that most people around you don't know what Purim means. But they do know you. Maybe they can hear what God has done for you when you tell them. Imagine yourself looking at your life. It's the last few moments of your life. And like the sands dripping through an hourglass. Your days are gone. And you're thinking back how you've lived your life. Do you want it to be where you've been in victim mode? Explaining all the ills of your life, all the decisions, all the things you didn't, wouldn't, or couldn't do because this is what's happened to me. This is why I lost my job. This is why my kids don't talk to me. This is why my spouse. This is why I never got that big break. This is why I have these health issues. You can go down a litany of things. Or you can look at your life as a victor and say, Boy, I saw God do this. And I saw God do that. And even when I was dealing with this, I saw God do an amazing thing. I saw God use a man who had only 40% of one lung. I saw a man who had a disability. But he brought joy and happiness to everybody in his presence. I saw a man who was blind in a wheelchair. Who got saved in the latter part of his life. And the glow on his face and the joy in his words... And the Christ-likeness that was in his spirit filled the room. I saw a life where everybody whose life was touched was made better. When you start to think about moving 
from living as a victim to living life as a victor. You're going to have to live life. Love God. Listen to God. And you're going to have to learn to see things from God's perspective. That's the story of this book of Esther. As we close, we move again to this incredible commentary by John MacArthur. This invisible hand of God is evident everywhere. The absence of God here is intentional. An ingenious strategy by the writer to draw the reader to think deeply about how life circumstances are ordered by divine purpose. Not coincidence, too many. Not random, there's a designer, a coordinator, a power behind it all. God literally thunders through the book of Esther. No, there are no miracles in the book of Esther, but the whole thing is an incredible miracle. The message for you and me, when we go through life, we may not see those burning bush epic moments. We may not have those incredible transforming experiences. We may not have those moments when we have to throw ourselves on the grenade. And we may not be able to don a cape and use our allowance to buy people sandwiches. But every single one of us has the potential for greatness. Every single one of us has the potential to make a difference in someone's life. And who knows? Who knows the life that you might touch? Nobody's ever heard of the man Mordecai Ham. But everybody's heard of Billy Graham. But there would have never been a Billy Graham if Mordecai Ham hadn't been speaking the truth of God's word that day. We're moving into the Lord's Supper. And as we do, I want you to be thinking about what we've learned today. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11, For I received from the Lord himself that instruction which I passed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This represents my body, which is offered as a sacrifice for you. Do this in affectionate remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant, ratified and established in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in affectionate remembrance of me. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are symbolically proclaiming the fact of the Lord's death until he comes again. So whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in a way that's unworthy of him will be guilty of profaning and sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. But a person must prayerfully examine himself and his relationship to Christ. And only when he has done so should he eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For everyone who eats and drinks without solemn reverence and heartfelt gratitude for the sacrifice of Christ eats and drinks a judgment on himself if he does not recognize the body of Christ. That careless and unworthy participation is the reason why many among you are weak and sick and a number sleep in death. But if we evaluate and judge ourselves honestly, recognizing our shortcomings and correcting our behavior, we will not be judged. But when we fall short and are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined by undergoing his correction so we will not be condemned to eternal punishment along with the world. Gentlemen. Father, I pray that you would bless this as we partake today. Let us be mindful, Lord, of the sacrifice you made. You weren't a victim. You were the victor. God, I want to praise you and thank you for that. Thank you that you didn't, Lord, let them take anything from you. You gave it. What a beautiful story. I pray to Father that you would open our eyes today. Be mindful of this sacrifice that we might live 
sacrificially as well. We ask this in thy name. Amen. Jesus on the night in which he was betrayed took the bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said this represents my body which is offered as a sacrifice for you. Do this in affectionate remembrance of me. the same way after supper he took the cup saying this cup is the new covenant ratified and established in my blood do this as often as you drink it in affectionate remembrance of me
last song. Stand with me.